Dear second year students, hi again. This is part two of lecture seven of Helminth's. Now we'll talk about phylum Nemat Helminth's or Nematoda. Example number one, Ascars lambricoids. It's found in the small intestine of man and maybe other organs. Causes a disease called Ascariasis. The worms also known as the abdominal snake this is its common name because it is considered one of the tallest human nematode worms therefore sometimes it's also called the large round worm the worm is pink elongated cylindrical and tapers both interiorly and posteriorly to relatively blunt conical ends the posterior end of the female is straight, while that of the male curves ventrally, which help in recognizing its sex, as well as the bigger thickness of the female worms. These are the male and female Ascars lambricoids worms. Look at the posterior end, the curved posterior end in the male, and to the thickness of the female. Life cycle. The adult worms inhabit the lumen of the small intestine and feed from the semi-digested food of the host and sometimes they bite the mucosa of the intestine by their denticulate lips and sucks the blood and body fluids. Copulation occurs at this site and eggs are passed with host feces. The fertilized egg at the time of oviposition is spherical or subspherical and consists of the following observed structures. 1. A coarsely granular spherical ovum that usually doesn't completely fill the shell. 2. A thin innermost membrane that is highly impermeable. 3. A relatively thick colorless middle layer that is smooth on both inner and outer surfaces. 4. An outermost coarsely mammillated albuminoid layer laid down in uterus serving as an auxiliary protective membrane this layer is golden brown due to the bile pigment absorbed from feces مثل ما تلاحظون بدينا بالتركيب ابتداء من الداخل باتجاه الخارج these are many photos for the eggs of Ascars lambricoids. Look at the uh, outer layer, the mammillated layer. It's called the warty egg. البيضة ذات الثقاليل. شوفوا من برا أكو هذه التموجات بالغلاف الخارجي اللي هي مثل الثقاليل. Fertile eggs are passed in one cell stage. This is mean that the cleavage started in the embryo inside the egg before it exits outside. They survive putrefaction and can withstand considerable desiccation and cold. They are also tolerant to chemicals. To start in development, they need a temperature less than that of the human body and a little humidity and O2. At 22 to 33 degree, development to the infective stage larva usually occurs in three to four weeks. The first larval stage, L1, produces in 10 to 14 days when the suitable conditions are available in the soil. These suitable conditions, the shed, humidity, 22 to 33 degree, temperature and O2. After two to four weeks in moist soil at optimal temperature and oxygen levels, the embryo molds in silic 
at least once in the shell and develops to an infective second larval stage L2. The infective stage in this case on the opposite with other nematodes but recently it has been found that larva inside the egg passes through two moltings so the infective stage may be third stage L3 as well as in the other nematodes. Eggs containing infective larvae may remain viable in the soil for two years or longer. When human ingests the egg, the infective larvae hatch in the duodenum and penetrate the intestinal wall, enter the mesenteric venules or lymphatics, and via the liver, inferior vena cava, or the hepatic duct, reach the right side of the heart and passes through the pulmonary vessels to the lungs. On about the ninth day of infection, after doubling their length in the tissue tissues of the lung, they begin migration via the trachea to the throat, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, to the intestine, where they become sexually mature 4 to 12 weeks after exposure. The adult worms may live in the body up to 16 to 20 months but usually they are passed spontaneously in about 12 months the most important method for infection is the entrance of the eggs to the mouth by the contaminated fingers especially in the children and also drinking contaminated water pathology and symptoms the infection with 10 to 20 worms considered normal infection and mostly lasting without recognition for the infection from the patient. The feces examination detects the worms which exit with the feces of the infected person spontaneously. The pathogenicity in the severe infections may be leads to dangerous symptoms as in the following. A. Juvenile larvae. There is a slight injury caused by the larvae when they penetrate the mucosa of the intestine. They also causes a little bleeding when they penetrate the pulmonary capillaries, but in the acute infection, they causes a blood aggregation that leads to edema and obstruction of the air vesic vesiculates. Many larvae may reach to the left side of the heart, especially in the heavy infections and transmitted to the body organs and tissues such as the spleen, liver, lymph nodules, and brain, where they cause inflammations and other pathological changes. The larvae could also reach to the fetus transplacentally. B. Adult worms. The adult worm may discomfort its host as an abdominal pain associated with vomiting, diarrhea and simple elevation in the body temperature and sometimes the infected person fills out the mild infection if the worms in the heavy infection discomforted by eating unsuitable foods or because of the drugs they curve themselves around others and obstruct the intestine which leads to the death and sometimes obstructs the vermiform appendix. It was noted that there are chemical substances secreted by the worms inhibits the trypsin enzyme action and prevent the digestion of the proteins and disturb the beneficiation from these important substances. It was also noted that infected children become shorter and less memory than non-infected children. These worms may invade the pancreatic and bile ducts causes the obstruction or enter the liver and they may invade the peritoneum causes peritonitis which leads to death rapidly and even reach to the urogenital system. 
the metabolic products of the worms causes abdominal pain and sensitization appears as a pruritus and rush. The worms sometimes exit from the mouth during sleeping. In addition, worms that reach to the esophagus may enter the trachea causes an obstruction and damage in the lungs and finally it may causes a damage in ostachian tube diagnosis diagnosis is made by the identification of its warty eggs in the feces since egg production is fairly constant about 200,000 eggs per female daily. Egg counts can provide reasonably accurate estimates to the number of adult worms. Diagnosis can also be done by detecting the adult worms by the x-ray and also the detection of the larvae in the sputum. Treatment for treatment of individuals in whom adult worms have been verified in the intestine but who do not require hospitalization, a single dose of pyrantil pamoid is highly effective. One-time treatment with mebendazole or albendazole are acceptable alternatives. Piperazine citrate is highly effective in cases of intestinal obstruction. The drug paralyzes the worm, nullifying its ability to counter host intestinal peristalsis and causes it to be passed. If the obstruction persists, surgery may be necessary. Example number two, Enclostoma duodenale. It's called the hook worm, a didan a this parasite causes a disease called enclostomiasis and the worm called old world hookworm. The infection has a worldwide distribution. The adult worms found in the small intestine of man hanging on the mucosa feeding on the blood and tissue fluids. The living adult worms are pinkish in color. Their body is narrow anteriorly with curved head dorsally. The adult worms are cylindrical. The posterior end of the male has an umbrella-shaped bursa, copulatory bursa, which is considerably broader than its long and is supported by a rib-like ray. Look at these pictures. To the left, the male worm, and this is magnification to the posterior end beside it, then the mouth and mouth part, then the female worm, and finally the egg of the worm. Life cycle. Humans almost exclusively are hosts for Enclostoma duodenale. Each female worm lays up to 25 to 30,000 eggs daily. The broadly ovoid eggs have a thin transparent shell and are in 2 to 8 cell stage of cleavage when evacuated. Embryonation to the first rhabditoid larval stage takes place in 24 to 48 hours on moist sandy loam rich in organic materials in a shaded environment at an optimal temperature of about 23 to 33 degree. The rhabditiform larva matures and hatches from the thin-shelled egg. Then it molds to produce the strongly formed larva which feeds on the bacteria and organic materials in the soil and doubles its size. In five days, after two molds, the rhabditiform becomes a non-feeding infective filariform larva, the infective larva. The cuticle of the last mold is retained and encloses 
the larva as a sheath. The filariform larva migrates to the superficial layer of the soil waiting a chance to be in contact with a human skin to penetrate it. The active in sheathed filariform larvae inhabit the upper 10 cm of soil usually remaining within 50 cm of the initial site of oviposition where they can uh, where they can live up to 6 weeks human infection occurs when these larvae penetrate the skin usually of the feet and legs entry is most often gained through hair follicles pores and skin scratches upon penetration the larvae enter the host's lymphatic system, then migrates to the right side of the heart and enter the lungs via the pulmonary artery. When rupturing from lung capillaries, they enter the alveoli and migrate up the respiratory tree, molting in root and then are coughed up and swallowed. This migratory period lasts about one week. Once the larvae reach the small intestine, they actively hide into the intervillous spaces where at about the 13th day, they undergo their fourth molt and become sexually mature adult male and female worms five to six weeks post penetration and stay attached to the mucosa. The infection can also be acquired by humans orally through foods and water contaminated with eggs and in some endemic regions this is the primary means of transmission. Following ingestion the filariform larva is swallowed and molds twice in root develops to sexual maturity in the small intestine. Pathology and symptoms. The pathogenicity depends on the number of worms, the infective stage or phase, and the feeding of the infected person. The course of a human hookworm disease can be divided into three phases, invasion, migration, and establishment in the intestine. One. The invasion phase, which also called the cutaneous phase, and causes skin lesion. This phase commences soon after the larval penetration to the skin. It causes mechanical injury to the, to the skin layers because it slips through the spaces of the skin or enter the hair follicles, which may cause the entry of the pathogenic bacteria with it and leads to an inflammation with itch called ground itch. This phase short if the secondary infection with bacteria is absent. Although little damage is inflicted upon superficial skin layers, host cellular reaction stimulated during a blood vessel penetration may isolate and kill the larvae. The local irritation from the invading larvae combined with the inflammatory reaction to the accompanying bacteria evokes the urticarial condition of the ground itch. 2. The migration phase Larval migration through the lungs or it's called the pulmonary phase. It is the period during which larvae escape from capillary beds in the lung, enter the alveoli, and progress up the bronchi to the trachea and throat. This migration can produce severe hemorrhaging. It's dangerous depends on the number of the juvenile worms it's occurring in the acute infections and may lead to death. Otherwise, 
a dry cough, sore throat, and pneumonitis may be the only symptoms. 3. Establishing or intestinal phase. The most serious stage of hookworm infection. Upon reaching the small intestine, young worms use their buccal capsule and teeth to burrow through the mucosa where they vigorously being feeding upon blood. Salivary secretions of the worms contain anticoagulants to facilitate blood feeding. The continuous blood loss leads to loss most the body iron and large amounts of protein which leads to erythrocytopenia. Even if 40% of the iron removed by the worms is reabsorbed by the host, an iron deficiency anemia develops, accompanied by nausea, intermittent abdominal pain, anorexia, loss of appetite, sometimes diarrhea and a craving to eat soil, geophagy. Heavy infections often produce severe anemia, a protein deficiency, a dry skin and hair, edema, distended abdomen, especially in children, stunted growth, delayed puberty, mental dullness, cardiac failure, and even death. The RBCs become smallest and their hemoglobin less than that of normal RBCs. The worm sucking about 0.5 cubic centimeter of blood daily and about 200 cubic centimeters daily in the acute infection. Edema around the eye and the lower limbs may be associated. There is also eosinophilia with charcot laden crystals in the feces appear during the late prepatent period. The infection is very dangerous during pregnancy because the infant requirement for protein and iron will increase. Look at these crystals. This is the charcot laden crystals. Diagnosis. For light infections, concentration diagnostic techniques such as zinc sulfate, flotation, or several modifications of the uh, formalin ether method are employed. Examination of the eggs cannot distinguish between Nicator americanus and Enclostomododinel. El Nicator americanus, another type of hookworm, but it's it is less spreaded in our area. Larvae can be used to differentiate between Nicator americanus and Enclostomododinel by rearing filariform larvae in a fecal smear or a moist filter paper stripped for five to seven days. Treatment. In light to moderate hookworm infections in which the anemia is not severe, a specific treatment can usually be undertaken without a preliminary period of supportive treatment. For individuals with low hemoglobin levels, it's desirable to prescribe a diet rich in animal proteins for a week to 10 days before the specific chemotherapy. Iron must also be admin administered to replace that which is lost during the intestinal hemorrhage caused by the worms. Rarely, a whole blood transfusion may be needed. Several drugs provide effective treatment for human hookworm species. Mebendazole or albendazole administered orally for three consecutive days results in a very high rate of care. The most effective drug without significant side effects is probably the mebendazole. 
host immune response. Hookworm infections induce strong immune responses, but there is little evidence that these responses are protective. Information on T cell activity in hookworm infection is insignificant. Available data indicate that a T helper 2 response a predominant, generating IgE and eosinophils. In vivo experiments suggest that eosinophils can kill infective L3 larval stage, but not adult worms. The dominant T helper 2 cytokines in response to adult worm infections are interleukin 4, interleukin 5, and interleukin 13, with interleukin 4 promoting IgE synthesis. Example number 3 Enterobius vermicularis. هذه هي الدودة الدبوسية. أو الدودة المقعدية مالت الأطفال اللي تقريبا كل الأطفال ينصابون بها بالسنة الأولى من عمرهم. It's parasitic only on humans and may be the most common parasitic nematode worm of man, commonly known as pinworm or seat worm. It has been known since the ancient times. It's familiar to parents of young children worldwide. The worm is small and found in the large intestine of man. Causes enterobiasis or oxyuriasis. It has a cosmopolitan distribution but is more common in cold or temperate zones than in tropical areas. Adult worms characterized by its spindle shape. The mouth of the adult worm have three lips. The male worm has a strongly curved posterior end. The lateral view of the worm forms an inverted question mark. يعني شكل الذكر بشكل عام وكأنه علامة استفهام مقلوبة. ليش؟ لأن هو من ال من النهاية الخلفية يتقوس بشكل حاد وكبير يصير بالضبط يشبه علامة الاستفهام. The female is considerably longer than male. The sharply pointed post-anal portion is nearly a third of the total length and it's the cause of the name pin worm. الأنثى من بعد فتحة المخرج مالتها تبدي تستدق بشكل كبير بحيث يصير شكلها مثل الأبرة أو الدبوس من النهاية وهذا سبب تسميتها بالبن وام Look at these photos To the left the male worm and to the right the female worm Look at the pointed end of the female worm and this is the curved end of the male. Life cycle. The characteristic habitat of this worm is the ileocecal region, cecum and appendix. But generally, they are crawling along the digestive tract from the stomach to the anus, hanging on the mucosa where they are feeding on the epithelial cells and bacteria. After fertilization, males die and detection of males become difficult and rare and must use a purgative for this purpose. When the female body become filled with eggs, it becomes free in the intestine and migrates to the rectum and exits through the anus during the night during the host sleep or relaxation and lays up its eggs on the skin of the perianal region. More eggs released when the female's body ruptures and sometimes the eggs exit with feces. The eggs are elongated, oval 
and flat from one side with a colorless double shell an inner membrane and an outer albuminous layer that causes them to stick to each other and to clothing and other objects each contains upon deposition an immature larva the female lays up 4,000 to 16,000 eggs then die after egg laying the infective third stage larva completes development within the egg several hours after leaving the body of the female worm about six hours the eggs resist the putrefaction disinfectant and is still alive for about one week in a humid cold weather and they are highly resistant to drying some evidence suggests that eggs can remain viable for years under favorable conditions this worm need not an intermediate host the infection occurs always throughout the ingestion of the mature eggs which contain the third larval stage l3 ingested eggs usually hatch shortly after reaching the duodenum the escaping larvae undergo two molds before the development to adult worms as they migrate posteriorly reaching sexual maturity by the time they arrive at the colon the life cycle from the egg to the mature worms lasting 16 to 43 days with a lifespan of around two months look at these photos of the egg the first one aggregation of a large number of eggs and this is the second one is a magnified photo then the third one more magnified this is a single egg and the fourth one more magnified mode of infections one the most common method for infection is the direct infection or self-infection when the patient is reinfected by hand to mouth transmission from the anus to the mouth throughout the contaminated fingers the infection also occurs through the contaminated beds and any other contaminated objects used from an infected person two the eggs are very light so it's very simple to separate in the air during the cleaning of beds and clothes of the infected individuals therefore the inhalation of eggs which found in the air with the dust is another source of infection three the retro infection where the infection occur in the same individual it occurs when the skin crypts of the perianal region is not clean for a long time the aggregated eggs may hatch and the larvae migrate back to the large intestine and grow to adult worms for the cross infection when infective eggs are ingested either with contaminated food or from fingers that have been in contact with a contaminated surface or body parts from infected humans children especially of early school age are most vulnerable to enterobius vermicularis infection in households with heavily infected individuals infective eggs have been found in samples of dust taken from chairs table tops dresser tops floors baseboards etc pathology and symptoms 
pinworms are not highly pathogenic. Clinical symptoms such as itching, pruritus, and irritation are caused by the migration of gravid females around the perianal, perineal and vaginal areas. Heavy infections in children may also produce such symptoms as sleeplessness, weight loss, hyperactivity, grinding of teeth, abdominal pain, and vomiting. Gravid females may also migrate up the female reproductive tract, become trapped in the tissues and encapsulated causes granulomata in the uterus and fallopian tubes. They may also migrate to the appendix and often are suspected of causing appendicitis or migrate to the peritoneal cavity or even the urinary bladder. Rarely, they have been found in a granulomata in the parenchyma of the lung and liver. Diagnosis Specific diagnosis made on the recovery of the adult worms and or eggs. Female worms emerge at night and are frequently visible in the perianal and perennial regions. Adult worms can often be observed in feces as well. However, eggs are found in feces in only about 5% of cases. The seal of tape technique for the recovery of pinworm eggs from around the anus has been demonstrated to be the most satisfactory. It is doing by pressing transparent adhesive tape, cellulose tape, on the perianal skin and then examining the tape placed on a slide. These preparations are more likely to be positive when perianal impression specimens are taken in the early morning before defecation or a shower or bath. Negative results from this protocol for seven consecutive days constitute confirmation that the patient is free of infection. Alternatively, anal swabs or swab tubes, a puddle coated with adhesive material, can also be used. Eggs can also be found but less frequently in the stool and occasionally are encountered in the urine or vaginal smears. Adult worms are also diagnostic when found in the perianal area or during anorectal or vaginal examination. Treatment Following positive diagnosis in any individual, treatment should be administered to all members of the household, either pyrantil pamoate, albendazole, or mebendazole, usually administered in a single dose and repeated once after two weeks are the treatment of choice. Mebendazole and albendazole are contraindicated for pregnant women since they are teratogenic in the experimental animals. Piperazine hexahydrate Thiabendazole is also effective but causes nausea and vertigo. Important notes 1. It's often desirable to treat the entire family group at the same time. 2. Treatment should be repeated after about two weeks to eliminate worms acquired from eggs persisting in the environment after the initial treatment. 3. Patients and parents should be made aware of the probability of reinfection, which should not be mistaken for treatment failure. 4. During the treatment, it should be made an examination for the feces daily for 7 days, more to ensure the recovery. With this slide, we reach the end of the lecture.
Thank you for your listening.